Hey everybody, this is the Life Group Lesson for Sunday, September the 17th, 2023. We are in the Gospel of Mark today in chapter 3, starting with verses 20 following. I have my journal here with me today, and I want to share with you five things that we can learn from today's passage, which is entitled, Questioned. Before we begin, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, as we read the passage in Mark's Gospel today, help us to learn about Jesus' authority which is over all creation, including over Satan, our enemy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing we want to see in today's passage is that Jesus' authority is greater than our family. Let's look at Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Here we learn about Jesus' immediate family and their response to his ministry. Sometimes we see Jesus being swarmed by masses in a way that his normal activities were actually hindered. And here in this occasion, Jesus and his disciples were not even able to eat. Now, as believers, we need to be careful in our evaluation of crowds. We tend to measure the popularity and even the spirituality of an event by how many people show up. And what we see here is crowds frequently hindering the ministry of Jesus. This isn't to say that large crowds are bad or that small numbers indicate a greater holiness. But we must remember that submission to the holiness and the authority of Christ is more important than satisfying the desire of a majority of people. The value of family is virtually unquestioned in scripture and in our theology. Spiritual and secular people both can be heard talking about the importance of relationships that we have within our families. God invented family in the very beginning, and because of the priority of the family, we might actually be prone to accepting it as the highest authority in our lives. But here we see if Jesus had allowed his family to restrain him, he wouldn't have been able to go on to provide the salvation that he came to offer all of us. The word translated here that they went to restrain him is a strong word, it's sometimes used in the sense of arrest or to take by force. Jesus' own brothers believed that he was out of his mind, and they did not accept his claims about who he was until after his resurrection. The second thing we want to see in today's passage is that Jesus' authority is greater than our religion. Let's look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. Comparing this passage with the one before it, we see that Jesus' family is attempting to restrain him with good intentions. That is not the same case of the scribes who come down from Jerusalem. These scribes are teachers of the law who saw themselves as the guardians of the law and the Old Testament. When it says that they came down from Jerusalem, this infers that a group or committee had been delegated to come down and evaluate Jesus and his teachings. So their accusations about Jesus become very scathing and critical. And so they slander him as being in cahoots with Satan. These religious leaders are alleging that Jesus' power to cast out demons was because he himself was demon-possessed. And so the scribes conclude that Jesus is possessed by an evil force and he's simply a raving madman. And they use the term, he's possessed by Beelzebub, which is a reference to a false Canaanite god. By the first century, the Jews began using the same name for Satan. They didn't deny the fact that Jesus was able to free people and do miracles and cast out demons, but they believed he was using a demonic power to do this. The third thing we want to see in today's passage is that arguments against Jesus' authority are foolish. Let's look at verses 23 to 25. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. These accusations that the scribes made against Jesus found their way back to him. Therefore, he summons them and he speaks to them directly, but uses parables. We often see parables as educational in nature, but when we examine them closer, we see that Jesus uses parables to confront and expose those who hear them. In this particular parable, he confronts the religious leaders, and there's no evidence that they repented or believed in Jesus when he does so. 
Jesus asks a question. How can Satan drive out Satan? To give the power of exorcism to Satan is illogical and absurd. And Jesus points this out quite logically. This scenario presented by the religious leaders would have the devil working against himself. And this reminds us that the arguments raised against the authority of Jesus are always foolish and they dismiss the evidence. Jesus tells a parable that is twofold. It's about a kingdom and a house. Both are pictured as being divided against themselves. And in both cases, the result of the division is defeat and destruction. This reference of a kingdom is anticipating what the New Testament is going to say about the realm of Satan's activity. Satan is the ruler of this age that we read in Ephesians, but Jesus triumphs over Satan. The fourth thing we want to see in today's passage is that Jesus' authority is greater than Satan's. Let's continue in verses 26 and 27. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder the house. Jesus implies here that the only way a person could go in and take something from a stronger person would be to bind up the strong person. In this case, Satan is depicted as the strong man and able to take people captive. But Jesus is stronger. His deity and his miracles free people from Satan's power because Jesus has authority over all things, including Satan. And because of that, our victory is assured. Jesus' strength here doesn't come just in education, but in transformation. One of the uh, ways that we diminish the authority of Jesus is seeing his identity exclusively as just a teacher or a rabbi. He is that, but he is much more than just an educator. Jesus came to defeat the power of evil and rescue all of humanity from his enemy and our enemy, Satan. He has the power and the authority to free people from oppression that holds them bondage. Jesus is first our savior, and he is also our teacher. Before we can truly follow his teachings, we must first be saved from our sin and given freedom from the power of Satan's strength. Jesus is stronger than Satan, and he can do that. The final thing we wanna see in today's passage is that Jesus' authority is greater than our sin. Let's conclude with verses 28 to 30. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whoever blasphemes, they utter. And whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying that he has an unclean spirit. Forgiveness is available for all sins, but there is one exception Jesus mentions here, and that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. To blaspheme is to speak against God. In Luke, Jesus says that speaking against him can be forgiven. Prior to Jesus' crucifixion, Roman soldiers mocked Jesus, but even these insults could have been forgiven through a belief in what Jesus is about to perform, an atoning sacrifice for all sin. Jesus says that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is what cannot be forgiven. So why is this the unforgivable sin? Remember, Jesus' critics had accused him of doing miracles with the power of the devil rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. And the sin that Jesus warned against is not a single act, but a continual refusal to identify Jesus as the Christ and attributing his works to him by Satan. And there's no forgiveness for these religious leaders because they would not seek it where it can be found, in submission to the authority of Jesus. Because it's not a one-time event, but a continual, ongoing attitude, that makes it an eternal sin. They adamantly refuse to recognize that Jesus is the Christ and worked through the power of God. So if you're worried about this unforgivable sin, you have to remember that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a continual, ongoing attitude and action that never, ever ceases during your life. And that is where unforgiveness comes in. It isn't until we repent of our sins and accept the forgiveness of Jesus through grace and by faith that we can be saved from all sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that is good news for all of us. So as we conclude today's passage, there's a few things we can take away 
and learn from. The first is that believers should not be surprised when others are skeptical about Jesus. Also, believers can trust in Jesus' authority because it's over everything. And finally, believers should be heartbroken when others reject Jesus. Thank you for joining me for today's session in the Gospel of Mark. I will see you in our next study.